Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine in preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria. Well, I invite you to turn today to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, this, in, in a way, we're coming back to 1 Corinthians in a way we didn't ever leave. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 established, don't go beyond what is written. And Paul applied that to the division and factions that were happening in, in the Corinthian church. We needed to see what is written about one another in Romans 9. We focused on a portion of Romans 9, uh, 12, uh, verses 9 to 13. The, the other verses there could have also been read, but we focused there. And so now we are going back to really these two verses could be considered one, one unit, verses 6 and 7. We covered verse 6. We're looking at verse 7. This is a crucial verse in the history of Christian doctrine. This verse, as it has impacted people through the centuries, is one of the reasons why there are even denominations. And you might say, boy, it's a terrible thing that we have denominations and we're all divided. Yes and no. Um, each, each person individually has a responsibility to believe the Word of God. And that responsibility and that person's conscience is directly um, obligated to God and not some human decree or human authority, even a church authority. So as Baptists, one of the, one of the best things about the identity, what it means to be a Baptist is that we believe in local church autonomy and we believe, we believe that we're not compelled to be here by any state or human authority and we believe that no one of our individuals should be compelled to be here by that way, but rather we have chosen to meet here together because we want to worship God and we read His Word and we conclude we conclude with a very, in a very specific way we read His Word based on the words that He chose to use and what they mean in their context, in, uh, both literary, historical, and in the wider context of the Bible. And, and because of that, we've come to some conclusions, and so we're Baptists. But that's a label that describes some of our conclusions about what the Bible says. This verse is crucial to that. There are, there are denominations, there are groups of people claiming to be Christian who will disagree with, with what this verse says. The reason I'm going to say what I'm going to say today is because I in good conscience cannot say anything else because it's clear. If, the, if we're looking at what the words say, it's clear. Now the apostle, and we'll get back to that, how it has impacted church history. The apostle Paul addressed the sinful problem of division in the church at Corinth by reminding the Corinthian believers of the fundamental realities of the faith, which demonstrate the inherent unity of the body of Christ. Now listen, that, that sounded like a churchy statement and some theology in there, but it's important. This is how Paul addressed the problem. The problem was we had factions, people who set themselves up as evaluators. I prefer this teacher. I prefer that teacher. This teacher is right. That teacher I don't care for. Uh, and what Paul did to correct it is not say, you know, we'd all be happier if y'all would quit doing that. And we're tempted to solve problems by doing that. But what he said was, no, no, what's true? That's what he did. He took them back to what is true. What's true about God, man, salvation, the church, the Messiah? What's true about these things? And let me show you how what you're doing 
cannot possibly fit with what's true. It doesn't fit with what the reality is. And included in those things that are true is the inherent unity of the body of Christ. He asks in 1 Corinthians 1, is Christ divided? And of course the answer is no. So why would his people called his body act divided? That's his reasoning. That's what he's doing. Paul cites the identity of believers as called of God who believe the preaching of the cross, which is folly to those who are perishing in chapter 1, verse 18. Among the things that he cites as reality in order to combat this problem, he refers to reality that worldly wisdom is incompatible with the truth of God. It's based on the flesh. It's based on operating in a fallen world, fallen people operating in a fallen world. It doesn't work with the truth of God. He reminds them of God's sovereignty and the reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit within believers individually and corporately, and all the blessings involved in that. He points to the coming judgment seat in which the Lord Jesus will reward his followers for their service to him and his people. He explains that all Christians and all Christian leaders and teachers are merely tools of God and should be regarded as slaves of God who are entrusted with the administration of Christ's headship over his church. That's important. That's important. Um, I have no right to paint any other picture um, of the office of pastor in the church than the one that God paints in his picture, in his, in his word, the picture that he paints. And that is that Christ's headship over the church is administered by called pastors, men that he appoints. This is how he is uh, administering his headship over the church. It's not just a free-for-all, but it is, it is ordered. Now, does that mean that there are not bad pastors? Of course it doesn't mean that. There are people who are serving in the role as pastor who God did not call. And there are ways to identify that. But, but this is how. And he, so he makes this point. It's an important point in this particular problem. And this is the problem that gets priority of all the other problems in this letter, this first epistle to the Corinthians. All of this means that any boasting must be in the Lord alone. Because of what he goes through in chapters 1, 2, 3, and the beginning of 4, that's a conclusion. And he says that a couple of times through there. There is no human boasting no, no human boasting is tolerable. In fact, it is unthinkable due to the nature of humanity contrasted with the nature of God. He brings his argument to its summary in our passage today, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. In verse 6, we learn the fundamental basis on which we must operate. We must learn not to go beyond what is written. The Reformers had a Latin phrase for that called sola scriptura. Scripture alone is our is our, uh, is our authority in faith and practice. Now in verse 7, we have two of the other solas that are clearly uh, implied. Sola gratia, by grace alone, and soli, do, soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. So in verses 6 and 7, we have three of the five uh, I think it's undeniable. Three of the five uh, of the solas, the slogans, mottos of what happened in the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation uh, of the 16th century. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Soli Deo Gloria. Even though those words may not be uh, explicit, I believe it's that they are undeniably implicit in our text today. In verse 7, we have three questions that press home Paul's instructions. The believers in Corinth were no different than any believers anywhere. The believers in Corinth were believers because of God's grace and not their own doing. And the believers in Corinth were boasting and glorying in humans, which is sinful, worthless, vain, self-righteous idolatry. That's, what it, that's why this is such a big deal to Paul. If you're willing to divide up and say, I prefer Paul 
you can have Apollos. When both Paul and Apollos are tools serving the master who owned them, then you are misunderstanding your relationship to Apollos and Paul and Apollos and Paul's relationship to Christ. And that begs the question, do you understand your relationship to the Messiah? This is why this is a fundamental problem. You know, this is a great opportunity for us. Why is Paul spending all of these chapters dealing with factions in the church when there's things that, listen, I'm going to tell you, if we did a survey and said, what do you think is a bigger problem? Factions in the church or adultery in the church? I'm convinced that most people would fill out the survey and say, well, adultery, you got to get that taken care of first. Well, that was happening in the church. We're Chapter five, we get to it. But not until we Paul has dealt with the issue of factions. Not just, not just because it caused a problem, because it threatened the message, the understanding of the gospel, of who Jesus is, of who we are in him. That's why. Because they were boasting and glorying in humans. They were boasting and glorying in humans, which is sinful, worthless, vain, self-righteous idolatry. Commentator David Pryor, he wrote, the major point of these two verses, that is verse 6 and 7, is the foolishness of boasting amongst people who owe everything to the grace of God. Now there are three questions in verse 7. Let's read them. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? This is another one of those verses that you will not see on a bumper sticker. I'm almost certain. I, at least I've never seen one. Show of hands, anybody seen this verse on a bumper sticker? And yet... When you dig, you find that this is a crucial verse in the history of Christian doctrine. Uh, it, it, it was convincing to a man named Augustine uh, in his formulating his understanding of how are we saved. And we'll get to that. Well, let's look at the questions. What I want to do is look at the questions um, in order. They're pretty straightforward. The middle one is crucial, so we're going we're gonna to look at it as it applies to Paul's argument. And then we're going to go back and, and deal with it a little bit in the bigger picture of the implications and how it has affected uh, the history of Christian doctrine and, and understand what this verse communicates is, is crucial to understanding why our statement of faith here reads the way it does why Pastor David and I labor to preach the doctrines of grace. Um, it's not because we think, well, you got two options and we like this one. So this is our club that we're going to be in. Um, we teach what we teach about who God is, who man is, and what salvation is because we are utterly convinced this is what the Bible says and means. And, and th this is another reason that going through the Bible gets us to things because I'm just guessing that if I ask you, uh, at least before we started 1 Corinthians, write your top 10 favorite verses, I don't think 1 Corinthians 4, 7 would probably be on many lists. And yet you, you drill down and you start looking, you see this is communicating something that is absolutely fundamental, essential to understanding who God is to who man is and what salvation is. And it's not that it's the only place in Scripture. We'll see that's not even close to the case. But this is Paul addressing sin and using a fundamental doctrine, and that is grace, the grace of God, to correct sinful misbehavior among believers that was practically causing problems. So the three questions, let's look at them. Number one, who sees anything different in you? That's what the ESV says. Uh, the, I guess my stab at the translation 
You could say, who sees anything special in you? One, one person suggested, who sees anything superior in you? <clears throat> this question means, who sees anything special in you such that universal absolute truth does not apply in your case? And you might think, well, nobody would do that. Listen, that's what everybody does. The Christian life is the continual reminder. Actually, the universal, absolute truth of the Word of God applies in my case. It applies to me. Isn't it the most human thing to sit in, in under the preaching of God's Word and, or hear Jesus uh, calling out the Pharisees and, and the human heart says, yeah, sick them, get all those sinners, call them to repentance, straighten them out. The struggle is to realize continually the, the absolute universal truth of God's word applies to me and in my case. Who sees anything different in you? That's what Paul is asking. What, why do you think you're operating outside of the truth of all that I've said? John Calvin wrote that Paul's question could be understood like this. The meaning is, let that man come forward, whosoever he be, that is desirous of distinction and troubles the church by his ambition. I will demand of him who it is that has conferred upon him the privilege of being taken out of the rank of the others and made superior to the others. He concluded, Calvin concluded, God does not confer so much upon any one as to elevate him to the place of the head but distributes his gifts in such a manner that he alone is glorified in all things. When you say or think, yeah, but this doesn't apply to me, like these Corinthian believers apparently were, were doing, or what Paul was saying, you can't do that. You're robbing God of glory. You're denying his law, his word. So that's, that's why this is a problem. That's why Paul is exercised. And, and if you don't get it yet, how, how passionate he is about dealing with this problem, then you're, you're going to see as we go through the verses that follow um, how, he, how he really is strong in addressing this issue. Well, how do we apply How do we respond to this question? Who sees anything different in you? Here's, here's, here it is. Absolutely nobody, including myself. That's the application. You need to answer this question. Nobody, including myself, sees anything different or special in me so that the truth of the Word of God does not apply in my case. I submit and yield to the Word of God. What it says, that I joyfully do. That is the application of this truth. The Spirit guides, but He guides according to the sufficiency of His Word. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, the solution there is obedience, sola scriptura. Learn by us not to go beyond what is written. And of course, Paul is applying that big truth, don't go beyond what is written, which many commentators think in verse 6 there is He's quoting a, a proverb or a saying that they were all familiar with. Don't go beyond what is written. And that's a great proverb and a great saying for us to be just circulating around here. Just remind each other, don't go beyond what is written. Don't go beyond what is written. But he applied it specifically to the problem. And that's why verse 6 says what it does, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another so that you would stop saying, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I Cephas, or I Christ. That's what he's doing. He's, he's applying this big truth to that. Who sees anything different in you? Nobody. There's not anything different. That's the application. Now, the middle question is the one that is the heart of the verse, gets to the heart of our relationship with God, man's relationship with God. You, this is this is one of the big, the big. This answer is the big question: Why? Well, okay. Part of it is because. Well, no, the answer is God. Okay, that's the answer. So, 
I don't know if they'll let you clip out of any philosophy classes, but if you want to, I'll sign a note and say we know the answer to that question. Why? God. That's the answer. Why are you experiencing what you're experiencing? Why, why, why is life what it is to you? Why, why are you who you are? Why? This question addresses that. What do you have that you did not receive? Here Paul applies the ultimate truth about sinful man in relationship to God to the situation in which Corinthians had set themselves up as judges of each other and of the leaders such that they divided themselves according to their own evaluations. They, they made their evaluations and they divided up. Paul's question applies the large reality again, just like the first question, to the specific problem at hand. Now we're going to consider that question, that middle question there in verse 7, and how it affects the big picture of Christian doctrine and, re and return to it and the reality that is conveyed therein. But for now, just understand as it, how it follows. Who sees anything different in you? I mean, what he's saying is, aren't you in the same category as everybody else in the world? You don't have anything that you didn't receive. You are utterly dependent on God. The air that you're breathing, you don't have a patent for that. You didn't create it. You're not piping it into your lungs. You didn't create the system in your body which allows you to breathe in the air that you did not provide or create and extract the oxygen out of it and, and provide uh, life so that your eyeball can see. You, you know that I could, you could go a long way in that one. Do you see that? Do you realize that not a single one of you have been here saying, okay, I'm multitasking, I'm breathing to get myself oxygen, I'm pumping blood through my heart, and I'm listening to this guy preach. You're not doing that, are you? You don't have to worry about the breathing. and the God did that. He just gave that to you. You are alive and living. Every being in the universe exists because of God. What do you have that you didn't receive? The answer is nothing you are not special so that this doesn't apply to my case. That's his application to this problem. Now look at his next question, which brings it home specifically for them. If, you, if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You say, well, what is it? Okay, anything, everything. But specifically here, your salvation, your standing in the church, your, your membership in the body of Christ, your existence as a follower of Jesus. Did you, did you initiate that? Did you accomplish that? Did you come up somehow to Jesus, say, hey, look, uh, I know you don't know me, but here's my resume. And Jesus say, wow, I want you. I got to have you in my body. You did not do that. You did not do that. Nobody's ever done that. Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. John in 1 John says, we love. And see, if you're not, care if you're not careful, the Corinthian way of doing this would stop the verse right there. We love. Look at us, Lord. Look at our loving. We are some loving people. But the rest of the verse says, we love because he first loved us. You don't have anything that you didn't receive. And if you didn't receive it, why are you boasting, glorying, exulting, acting like you, you didn't receive it? That's his question. Now, 
This is the logical follow-up to the correct answer to the second question, right? How is it possible that you're boasting and glorying in your chosen teachers and factions in your division that you have deemed appropriate by your own standards when you have absolutely nothing that you've gained by your own merit or accomplishment? If God did not appoint you of the judges of his, the, all the rest of his servants and his ministers, how can you act this way? That's what Paul is saying. It's based upon falsehood and not truth. That's why chapters 1 through 4 contain some rich doctrinal content because he's reviewing it. He's observing their behavior, which he heard about from, from Chloe, Chloe's people. And he's saying, how is this possible since you say you believe the gospel, since you say you believe the preaching of the cross, since you exist as a church to glorify God in Jesus the Messiah, how is it possible? Because here's the reality of God and the Messiah and salvation and man. How can you be denying that by your action when you only exist because of truth? So this is his, this is his strategy in dealing with a practical problem that's more than just a practical problem, it's a doctrinal problem. How can you act this way? Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 28 to 31. Let's, let's review a little bit as it's related to boasting. Paul had told them, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And that's Jeremiah 23 and 24. You say, is God being egotistical here? I mean, why does he, why does he not want any humans to boast in his presence? Because if he allowed that, if he thought it was okay or not that big a deal, he would cease to be, he would not be the God of the Bible. Because that's sin, human boasting in the presence of God is unthinkably wrong it is it is utter chaotic idolatrous rebellion against god because a human has nothing that he did not receive how do you boast from that position and if god said well that's okay it's not that big a deal he would no longer be holy 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 he wouldn't be the only one in his category he'd be just like us There's going to be any boasting. The command is boast in the Lord because he's the source of everything. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Look at verse Six, your boasting is not good. See, boasting and arrogance, being puffed up. It's the puffed up with pride people who are boasting in humans. It's the, the humble, truth living people who are worshiping God and boasting in Him. That, that's why this is so important. Boasting in humans is idolatry. Boasting in the Lord, that's, that's worship. One thirty-one and three twenty-one provide the explicit instruction. One thirty-one, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Three twenty-one, so let no one boast in men. Boast in the Lord, don't boast in men. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Let no one boast in men. Hear the explicit instructions. These instructions are about whom humans are to boast and exult and glory. God alone and never man. James Moffat wrote an expanded description of these questions and instructions from Paul that's helpful. 
This is, this is James Moffat's amplification of what is being, what is being communicated in chapter four, verse seven. I, I like it. I think it, I think it captures the spirit of what's being said. And, and I, I find it very compelling. See what you think. <clears throat> Who in the wide world sees anything special in you? Who has singled you out for this distinguished position of critics? You consider yourselves richly endowed with special gifts of knowledge and discrimination, do you? You plume yourselves on these attainments as though you had won them by your unaided merits and abilities. You have enough leisure and insight, have you, to criticize those who once served you in the mission? But all you have has been given you by God through us apostles, though you seem to think you can do without us now, you are so advanced." And he sums it up. He's, Paul is blaming them chiefly for failing to honor God properly. That's the issue. See, that's the issue. Paul is not saying, uh, I don't want all of, some of you going over there and not being in my party. It's not that Paul would have been okay if they'd all said, well, I'm in the Paul party. That is not what Paul is saying. He's blaming them. Moffat has nailed it. He's blaming, blaming them chiefly for failing to honor God properly and saying, here's what I like in my Christian leaders. I like this, 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 and this. Apollos has that. Paul doesn't. I have no time for Apollos. Uh, for Paul, I want Apollos. This is about love for God. It's about love for God and avoiding self-righteous idolatry. Now, that's, that's the application to the specific situation. I want us to take a few minutes and think about the big picture of how that middle question, especially all of them, but especially the middle one, have the impact that that has had on the history of Christian doctrine. People either believe in the sovereignty of God or not. Now, praise God, most circles that I've been in, at least the people say, I believe in the sovereignty of God, even if they uh, maybe don't, don't uh, flesh it out right. But, but there have been people in the history of the Christian church who have just denied it. There are people now who denied it. I uh, had a conversation the other day. Clark Pinnock's name came up. He, he changed sides during his life. Uh, early in his life, and I guess that would have been 60s, he was thought of as a rising star among conservative Bible, believer, Bible believers, a scholarly, uh, well, well-spoken, a good writer, and he would have been saying amen to what we're celebrating here today. At this moment... As far as I know, and I don't even know if he's still alive. I guess he is. But he would deny, he would deny this. Um, he, he believes in something called open theism, which means God knows all that he can know, but that does not include the future. So he's doing the best he can with the knowledge that he has. And he's brilliant, so he's able to anticipate some things he's like a great chess master he's just kind of always ahead of us a little bit but but he has no idea exactly what you're going to do that is not the god of scripture he's just he's he's an example uh, th this issue has divided people who say that they're christians so we must live out the reality of our total dependence on the grace of God. The second question here in this verse indicates the fundamental reality of our status. We are utterly dependent upon the sovereign grace of God for everything we have. This applies to the problem of divisions and factions in Corinth, but that's because it applies to every moment, every being, every molecule, every place. And it applies most certainly to our salvation. In their commentary uh, on 1 Corinthians, Archibald Robertson and Alfred Plummer observed, the question which he asks 
strikes deeper than the immediate purpose of this passage. It is memorable in the history of theology for the revolution that it brought about in the doctrine of grace. In A.D. 396, in the first work which he wrote as a bishop, Augustine tells us, To solve this question, we labored hard in the cause of the freedom of man's will, but the grace of God won the day. And he adds that this text was decisive. Ten years before the challenge of Pelagius, the study of St. Paul's writings, and especially of this verse, and of Romans 9.16 had crystallized in Augustine's mind his distinctive doctrine of doctrines of man's total depravity, of irresistible grace, and of absolute predestination. Now, Pelagius was a British or Irish monk who came along and opposed the conclusion that Augustine had reached, which was, in our sin, we are unable to, to do anything that is good in God's eyes, including desiring Him and choosing of our own ability to believe in Him. That's what Augustine concluded from his study of 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Romans 9, 16, and all of Scripture. Pelagius came along and said, no, 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 that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Adam was a bad example But each one of us, if we so chose, could stop sinning and just live righteous such that God would recognize it as that's righteous living. And we would be his for eternity. Now, multiple church councils met so that bishops, pastors, looked into it and unanimously declared what Pelagius was teaching as heresy. It is not what the Bible teaches. It is false. It is untrue. Uh, Now that didn't solve the issue because those who said it was heresy still ended up in about three different positions. Uh, They just rejected the one that salvation is all of man and none of God. But then you have semi-Pelagianism, which says uh, salvation is mostly of man, but has to be helped by God. And then you have, and I'm being very general here, so if you consider yourselves in one of these categories, I'm not trying to nail down every possible nuance. But uh, Arminianism would say it's, it's mostly of God, but, but man contributes. And then the biblical position for which I cannot find one single verse that threatens even a little bit this view, is that salvation belongs to the Lord. And by the way, that's a a Bible quote. That was not my, that's not a theological formulation. And that's the strength of this position. You can just say things like salvation is of the Lord. That's a Bible verse, Jonah 2, 9. And it's in the Psalms too. Um, But I want to read you some verses that that would have been in Paul's mind in some cases because they're in the law, the prophets, or the writings. And other verses from uh, the New Testament writings that say the same thing essentially, that assert God's sovereignty, okay? Because this is crucial. This, the Reformation happened partly because of how this verse affected Augustine. And let me say this about Augustine. He has a whole bunch of stuff that I think he is absolutely wrong about. So don't take this as as an endorsement of everything that Augustine believed. Um, And and that, you know, but he nailed this. (laughs) He was right about this. Um, But let's let's look at the scripture. 1 Corinthians 29, 11 and 12. This is David's prayer before Solomon was anointed as king near the end of David's life, uh, knowing that Solomon was building a temple. David prayed, Yours, O Yahweh, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Yahweh, and you are exalted as head above all. 
Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Job 42.2 I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's Job 42.2 Psalm 115.3, and thank you guys for getting these, getting these up. So if you want to copy them down, you can do that and review that. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Psalm 135.6, whatever Yahweh pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Proverbs 16.4, Yahweh has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Isaiah 46, 9b and verse 10, and then also 11b. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus said, and this is right before the famous passage where he said so wonderfully, and I rejoice that he said it, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Well, here's the verse right before that. Why can he say that? Why can he say, it's me to whom you need to come? Here's why I can say it. Matthew eleven twenty seven, all things have been handed over to be my by Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, that is Jesus, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 5, 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. John six sixty five, And He, Jesus said, This is why I told you that no one can come to Me unless it is granted to Him by the Father. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 9, 16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. And by the way, Romans 9, 16 is explicitly noted by Augustine along with 1 Corinthians 4, 7 as two passages that were crucial in his coming to understand the doctrine of divine grace, sovereign grace. Romans eleven thirty six in our old meeting place, we had it on the wall. I'm still a little bit, I'm still wondering if we can find a place because it just gets us in the right mindset. I love this verse. It just tells me it all applies to you, buddy. It, all of this applies to you because here is your God. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you, you can take the next few seconds and make a list of all the things that do not fall on the list of all things. And you're done. Thank you for that. I have a copy of it myself. All things are from Him. He's the source. Through Him, He's the sustainer. And to Him, He is the end. And despite what Clark Pinnock and the open theist think, he has declared the end from the beginning. And that's not my argument against him. That's Isaiah's statement writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's why we don't have to fret and worry 
because of what's going on in the world. It's all going according to plan. And that doesn't mean that it's all good and happy and enjoyable, but it's all going according to plan. And his purposes are perfect. Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 4a. He chose us. Ephesians 1, 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Did you hear that? We ha we're in him having an inheritance, and it's predestined. It cannot be changed. How can it not be changed? Because the one who decided this, who predestined this, is the one who works all things in the universe according to the counsel of his own will. He is unaffected by external factors. He said it in Isaiah, I have purposed it and I will do it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Titus 3, 5, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. James 1, 17 and 18, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And we, we read 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. What do you have that you did not receive? Absolutely nothing. Why are you boasting then as if you did not receive it? Here is the true value of unity in the body of Christ because it looks beyond humans and says this is all about Him. This is all because of Him. This is all in His plan and it ends up with him. This is his salvation. This is his accomplishment. This is his body. This is his church. To him alone be the glory. Matthew Henry summed up Paul's instructions and in our proper response to it. Those who receive all should be proud of nothing. Due attention of our obligations to divine grace would cure us of arrogance and self-conceit. May we all understand fully our utter dependence on God for everything that we have, including our salvation and place in God's church. May we live in light of God's grace, sola gratia, soli deo gloria. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. You've told us who you are, who we are, what justice demands, and then you supplied what justice demands so that we could go free. This is the power of the cross. And not only that, Lord, you have required righteousness of us and we have failed. So you have supplied a life of righteousness in the person of Jesus and, and imputed that, counted that to us as if we had lived that life of righteousness. We're yours. This is your salvation. This is your assembly of saved people. And so may we all live that out in unity for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.